Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Coleman. Thanks, Christian, for picking us up. Thanks, Royal Holloway. From the trip to the tribe, mycelial intelligence and the mouldy way to grow your NGO. Does that sound okay? All right, good. Today, uh, so the theme is taboo, and we're watching psychedelics move over into the mainstream, which is what quite a lot of us have been pushing for, or hoping for, for quite a long time. And now it's happening. It's uh, not sure how easy I'm feeling about it. There's all these venture capitalists coming in, and there's all kinds of stuff happening to this culture that we've been busy nurturing for such a long time, and now who's got their hands on it? So uh, I'm wondering what it's all about at this point, and here's some questions I'd like to ask and have us think about today is, so we've been going to these taboo zones, illegal zones really, uh, marginalized zones and bringing stuff back for a long, long time, decades. Um, what can we bring back to the world today? How can we influence the world from our psychedelic missions, our journeys? Um, why get high? What's the point? And what am I supposed to do? The kind of big questions about how you navigate the world. Um, are we going to be looking at traditional uses of psychedelics? We're going to be looking at modern uses of psychedelics. And I'm also very keen to hear and know what psychedelics say to us, what they say to you. So feel free to shout out at any point with any kind of level of enthusiasm what psychedelics say to you when you take them. Feel free to interrupt me. If it works on the live stream or on Instagram Live or on kind of computer network things that I don't understand, that people want to chuck in to places I don't understand, chat boxes and stuff, uh, what psychedelics they, Christian's going to read them out. So tap away. How does a mycelium think? I'm, that's what I'm interested in. Um, mushroom consciousness, psychedelic consciousness, network consciousness. So let's start by thinking about where we see mycelia behaving in the real world. Uh, and let's begin looking at the mycorrhizal root network. Um, I, we're going to get to the story I'm going to tell today. We're going to talk about historical uses, a little bit about my story through psychedelics and where I ended up, which is running a, an NGO, which is dedicated to reforestation, regeneration, ecosystem restoration in Brazil with marginalized communities. And we're working in a way which is quite different to uh, um, other NGOs, I think. We're very consciously moving away from a colonial uh, centralized network where you have uh, beneficiaries and benefactors and looking at how to partnership across um, uh, in the post-colonial world, which is quite complicated. And so I'm very interested in what the mycorrhizal root network can tell me about this, how to set up an NGO in a completely different perspective using the mycorrhizal root network as a model. What's the mycorrhizal root network? It's how trees communicate underneath the ground in the forest. Uh, it is a symbiotic collaboration, really, between roots and between fungal mycelial networks. And these things can be massive. They can cover entire forests. They can be fantastically old. There are uh, miles of mycelial fibers in every teaspoon of, of soil from the forest. So these things, that, there's a, a whole lot of networking going along underneath the trees. We didn't even know about it until, until um, we'd, well, I believe it was MIT. I think it was where they discovered the internet where they later discovered that there was uh, things going on, um, networks going on underneath the, um, underneath the soil of the forest. So what it does is it connects trees and plants into a superorganism. And it's the way that uh, trees communicate with each other, it's the way they collaborate with each other. So for example, if there is a threat made to a tree, in the forest, like an insect attack, for example, it will produce the infochemicals and it will spread those infochemicals through the mycorrhizal root network. And at the same time, it's producing defense chemicals, so it'll produce something that the insects don't like. And it could be very specific to that particular insect and not another insect. So that message will go down through the mycorrhizal root network, through these uh, mycelial connections, and off to other trees where it will stimulate and trigger the same response, which would be to produce. Uh, defense chemicals. So when the insect goes over to another tree, it finds it doesn't like that tree very much. And this is how the, this gives rise to collective resistance, collective resilience, because the whole forest, or all these different species together, 
and they are communicating across species. It's not just the same species that will react to infochemicals. Uh, it ensures collective resilience. And it also ensures that the forest can respond to responsibilities collectively. So for example, if a tree falls and the canopy opens and light starts to flood in, the mycorrhizal root network knows about it, it starts to communicate about how trees should grow in that area because they'll, they'll put on a growth spurt, for example. Certain plants will arrive, certain fungal, fun, uh, funguses will arrive. And every member of the community of the forest will act in a collective way to take advantage of those opportunities and to meet those threats. Because you don't really want holes in the canopy in a, in a forest. You want to have it plugged so you don't lose the humidity and the shade inside. So it's good for the whole if, we work, if they work together. So uh, another thing that um, fungi do that we don't do quite so well is um, they cross-fertilize. There's certain funguses which have 23,000 different genders. So imagine all the ways that they're connecting and producing uh, products out of that um, in incredibly broad spectral way of meeting and mating, getting together. So cross-fertilization between those funguses and collective resilience as well. That's the mycorrhizal root network. Um, and I'm also interested in how, you know, we're asking this question about how mycelia think, how, how mushrooms think. What do they do to our brain? This is uh, Robin Carhart Harris's research. You've probably seen this before. On this side, on the left-hand side, you've got a brain not on psilocybin. On the right-hand side, you've got a brain on psilocybin. So psilocybin specifically um, targets receptors that are found in high density in connector hubs in the brain, anterior cingulate cortex, for example, but other connector hubs in the brain. And what that means is that the uh, the, norm, the, the way that normal different parts of cognition, different parts of the brain integrate is knocked out, is knocked down. So um, what you find is different parts of the brain start to communicate, start to go into kind of um, into phase, if you like, uh, and new connections are made in a more distributed, distributed and decentralized way when you take psilocybin. That was me in this uh, experiment. Um, I was put inside a scanner in a helmet with a tennis ball on my chin, hold, told to stay very still while I had a big dose of psilocybin in my vein. Um, it was really boring, actually. I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, but they were monitoring my anterior cingulate cortex as I was looking at um, pictures of chaos and saying what I could see. One of the things that is difficult to do when you're on psilocybin is a Stroop test. That's a Stroop test. And simply what you do is you try and read out the word without mentioning the color. So that first one would be yellow, not red. Second one would be red, not green, right? That becomes more difficult when you're on psilocybin or acid or other psychedelics. And that is because this, um, these centers which are integrating information saying, okay, this is what you're reading and this is the color you're seeing. Those things start to flow together and become more difficult to distinguish. It's one of the things that psychedelics do. They, they bring things which are normally separate together. So for example, synesthesia be another example when you might see a sound, for example, those are normally different sites or you might feel somebody else's or increasing empathy, for example, feeling someone else's pain, you know? Uh, so that's one of the wonderful things that um, psychedelics do is they dissolve the edges between different zones, between different areas. And then when we look at our problems, we might say, oh, this is, mm, I hate that guy. Uh, and then we might think, hmm, maybe that guy isn't quite so separate from me. And maybe that edge, as that edge dissolves a little bit, we can start to see how we're involved in that hatred. Do you see what I mean? Um, so psychedelics, that kind of melding of edges or melding of uh, different zones allows us to see things in a slightly different way. And we're going to be talking about that because we're look, going to be looking at problem solving. So back to that question of what should I do, right? Solve problems. That's quite an important thing for us to do. Um, this is what Robin says about what happens when you knock out the, uh, well, when you take psilocybin. What would it mean if you were to, and he says metaphorically speaking, I cut it out, uh, to blow up a capital city. Uh, anarchy, implications for the entire system, the rest of the country. Regions which don't normally communicate, communicate more, right? So you can see that in the, uh, in the diagram there, this various different regions of the brains making a whole lot of new connections and all the exciting things that come out, come out of that. Um, I had a better time in Wales once. That was in Cardiff, uh, where I had that, where I was in that scanner. 
But another time I was in Wales, I took mushrooms and lay down underneath an apple tree, and it was amazing. Uh, I was watching the air and the leaves traffic together, swapping nutrients, or s swapping gases, and I could feel the roots going down to the earth and kind of becoming the earth almost, and the traffic of nutrients and the traffic of water, and I could feel my own body melting into the... Oh, it was marvellous. Good old days. Uh, my own, the process of my own breathing melding with the process of this, of this tree just doing its thing, uh, that edge dissolving. And here's a question. How can that edgeless, porous vibe influence the way that we move through the world and the works that we do in the world? And particularly in my case, how can I bring that into my work running an NGO, working with the reforestation? How does a network think? I want to talk about um, intelligence, networked intelligence a little bit, then we're going to come back to the history and things like that. So uh, slime mold is a fantastic little creature, single cell amoeba. Um, they go around and they hunt for food. They find food and digest it. Uh, occasionally they do something collective. So for example, when uh, conditions require it, as these things are kind of oozing around the forest, they will make a, uh, they'll come together and form a kind of mushroom like that. And then they'll spore, yeah? So these are single-celled creatures which collectively come together and do something really fascinating like that and fire off their spores. Um, but the intelligence that these guys are exhibiting, bearing in mind that they are super, super tiny single-celled amoeba, uh, is quite astonishing. For example, they can find their way around mazes. So if you put a slime mold into a maze, the first thing it will do, it will do that, and then it will gradually kind of work out the most efficient way to, to solve the maze. Yeah? How does it do that with just one cell? All we'll network together, isn't it clever? And they're very good at mapping territory. They're very good at optimizing distribution. This is a slime mold uh, and these are oats, they really like eating oats. So the oats are placed at the points of the Tokyo railway network and the slime mould goes and explores. It finds out the optimal way of connecting up all these oats. And then if you compare it to how, uh, how the Japanese did it, another very interesting collective organism, um, the, that's what the actual Tokyo network looks like and that's what the slime mold network, so it's even better than humans did it and that was in 26 hours. Uh, yeah, and you can also see that kind of distributed um, collective intelligence kind of, um, there's, there's a certain similarity with what's going on with different regions in our brains connecting in more direct, more distributed, decentralized ways. Uh, slime moulds also incredibly can anticipate time. So if you, this is time over here, these are hours, and that is the locomotion speed of, of slime mould. Basically, if you blast it with cold air for uh, five minutes every hour, when the first time you do it, the slime mould retreats. You can see it there. The second time you do it, the slime mould retreats even more. And the third time you do it, it's already retreating before, uh, five minutes before you, you administer the blast. Right? Which is kind of amazing, because it means that the slime mold is anticipating when this thing's going to come back. How does it do that? It's, it's one cell. Um, and then, so you've got anticipation, you've got learning, and you've got recall, because if you then stop blasting it for a while, but then you blast it again, it remembers that it's been blasted before, and it retreats even further. And then, even if you don't blast it the next time, you can see it's already kind of expecting. So it's constantly in response to cycles in the environment, in time as well as in space. Completely amazing. Anticipation, recall, learning and memory. These are all the signs of intelligence. So slime mold intelligence uh, works in space, it works in time. Uh, it solves problems, it's very good at efficient resource distribution and it's responsive to both threats and opportunities. Is that all making sense so far? Why does the slime mold do this? Uh, it likes to eat oats. Um, also, it's for the collective resilience of the whole. If it works together, it is more likely to survive. So it's about survival, really. How does it do it? How do individual cells do that? 
we don't know. Right? There are kind of all kinds of theories, but none of them have managed to explain how these guys are that intelligent. Sometimes they use microfilaments and there's all kinds of stuff going on, but it's, it's really, com the science is uh, under debate. Uh, we don't know. But we do know that the individual plugging into the network makes the individual into part of a superorganism, and the superorganism responds by understanding space and time and mapping out, um, mapping out things, solving problems, distributing resources, responding to threats and opportunities. Let's have a quick look at the traditional use of psychedelics here. So we've been talking about how the mycelia think, uh, what they do in our brains, how, so that last one was actually, a, it wasn't a mycelia, it was a, um, a slime mold, right, uh, which, is, uh, which is an amoeba. So we're talking about networks here, not necessarily fun funguses, but how, how, do networks, um, how do networks think. But let's look at how psychedelics are used in their traditional context. So in a tribal context, they are used for uh, healing. For example, when somebody's sick or when there's a plague on the, on the tribe, then the shaman is called in to work out what's the problem, right? And that may be, uh, the, the shaman would go, and go off and do his thing on his own or her thing on her own. Normally they'd go off to their hut, they'd drink their ayahuasca, take their mushrooms on their own, and then they'd come back with information for the tribe. And that may be, this is the plant you need to fix your disease. Or that may be, this is the guy you need to lynch to fix that disease because he's the guy who put a curse on you. Or it may be, um, the behavior needs to change, or it may mean the whole, the whole camp needs to move because perhaps there's something going on, going on with the water in that area, or perhaps the spirits of the water are unhappy in that area. Um, so the, these are the traditional roles of the shaman, right? Survival, hunting. There are some tribes in the Amazon where the only thing the shaman does is, make, is drink, make packs with the, let's say, totem animals, the, 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 uh, the spirits of particular game animals, so they can then go hunting the next day and go and find game, right? Um, where, to find, where to find food, basically, and making deals with the people who are in charge of the food. Politics, how to meet challenges, how to, how to resolve internal dispute, disputes. Still happens in um, Peruvian Amazon today uh, when they have local, um, local elections. The shamans will definitely get involved and you don't want to be anywhere near them because there'll be all kinds of invisible darts flying backwards and forwards. Right, most, uh, said to be the most jealous place in the entire world. So watch out. Um, how to resolve disputes. Uh, when to plant crops, right? Um, this still comes under the heading of divination. Yeah? Psychedelics were traditionally used for divination. The shaman would go off, get his information or her information, bring it back to the tribe. Divination around survival. Right, when to plant crops, when to move camp, for example. And war divination, when are our enemies going to attack? When should we ambush our enemies? It's not all love and light in the jungle. And also magic, you know, familiar spirits, making your, uh, making your invisible friends push things in your direction. So ayahuasca might be used for resolving disputes, but your familiar spirit might be used to resolve a dispute in your favour, for example. These are traditional uses. So notice that they are generally for protecting the tribe. Again, problem solving, responsive to threats and opportunities, uh, working over space and time. So for example, if you have to, uh, if we're talking about when to plant crops, we're looking, div divining into the future, when, 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 when the weather's gonna be good. If we're talking about when to attack the enemy, we're talking about um, kind of space and time, I guess that one is. Resource distribution, again, so the spirit of the game animal says there's going to be... I'm trying to think of the name of a Brazilian creature now. What are those little guys called? Uh, I've forgotten the name. There's going to be an animal in this certain area. Let's redistribute it, right? So you can see kind of um, similarities popping up in the traditional use and also in the way that slime moulds organise themselves and networks organise themselves. How does this happen? We don't know, right? I mean, most people think this is rubbish, the idea that you can drink ayahuasca and then go and do divination. Um, I'll ask you to take that on... Um, you take that as, as, <laughs> as you like, really. This is what they do in the, in the uh, indigenous groups in the traditional world. How do they do it? The shaman plugs into the network, his network of spirits, or her network of spirits. Um, I want to talk briefly about Mestre Reneo. Mestre Reneo is the guy who 
one of the very first to bring ayahuasca out of the jungle into a non-jungle context, into a Christian context. This is in Brazil. Uh, he was a two meter tall black man of slave descent. Came over from uh, Maranhão, which is in the north uh, east of Brazil. Went all the way over to the Amazon during the rubber boom. Um, very, very long journey. He's actually, you're actually closer to Africa uh, when you're in the northeast of Brazil than you are to, uh, to the Amazon. Right? Um, or, you, or you are to the, the other side of Brazil. Anyway, so there was, a, there was a, a rubber boom, lots of people coming in, there was a famine in the northeast. And this was one of the guys who arrived, Mestre Irineo, Raimundo Irineo Serra. And um, so he encountered ayahuasca in a traditional form uh, with a caboclo, a, a, um, let's say a shaman called Pizango, um, Caboclo Pizango. And, and he had a series of visions, and there's a whole story there, but to cut a long story short, this was the guy who started doing collective sessions where everyone drank ayahuasca together. So before that, most places you go, in the mestizo world or in the um, indigenous world, the shaman takes, as I've mentioned, the shaman takes a thing on his own or on her own, comes back with the information for you. Mestri said, let's do it differently. Everyone's gonna drink together, and you're all gonna play maraca together. You're all gonna shake the shaker together, right? And this whole different type of ritual grew up out of this uh, with these kind of dance works, everybody in, um, in lines, and a whole lot more Christian influence. Um, obviously, the, that part of the world at the time was very, very, very Catholic. Mestri, Mestri Irene himself was very Catholic as well. Um, so part, one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because it's my lineage and that's what I know about. Um, the other thing is this guy's quite important as a pivot point between the indigenous world and the, the modern use of ayahuasca. Um, so he, was, he uh, gained some fame as a healer. Um, working originally in the traditional way with whistling and um, ikaros, doing uh, individual, um, attending people individually, and a camp of people grew up, grew up around him in, in, in the forest, in the jungle, mostly black people. Uh, he was incredibly tall, two meters tall, and most people are quite short in this area, so he's quite an imposing figure uh, in quite a uh, traditional uh, racist part of the world. Um, certainly very Catholic. They thought that ayahuasca was um, the devil's brew, right? So he was, uh, this guy was born two years after slavery was uh, abolished in, in Brazil. So what are you talking about, 18, 1890s, around then, right? So still, he was born in a situation of extreme structural oppression of his people, and he was also using a brew that was, most people considered was, uh, was devil worship, right? So he, this guy knew how to tread carefully and deal with the state, deal with an oppressive state. And anyway, he became a healer. Uh, his camp of people in the forest uh, got the attention of the authorities. Uh, they were accused of de devil worshipping. The cops arrived with guns and surrounded his camp. And they said, you're going to shut this business down and stop worshipping the devil? And he said, no, I'm not. Uh, he resisted. He got arrested and taken to, uh, to be interrogated. By the end of the interrogation, he'd managed to convince the cops that not only was he not worshipping the devil, but he was doing good work. And they gave him some land in Rio Branco, um, <laughs> where he set up the first uh, Santo Daime Center, which is still there now, Alto Santo. So quite a turnaround, quite a persuasive guy. Um, and then what happened was he started planting food. He started planting loads and loads of food. And this proved to be very important because, um, so there was a rubber boom there. We were having wars over here in this part of the world and wars require rubber for the tires and also industry was expanding massively. So all, all that kind of rubber boom, the end of the 18th, um, end of the 19th, early 20th century we're talking about. Um, an English guy went out to this part of the world, stole a rubber seed, took it back to Chelsea Physic Gardens, propagated it and then started um, producing rubber in the English colonies. And that meant that the rubber boom collapsed and there was a famine. People flooded into Rio Branco, which was this, uh, became a kind of more of an urban center and people were starving. This guy and his followers were producing 40% of the food during this famine, right? Because this guy had said, let's plant food. So that's rather interesting as well, isn't it? We've got the, um, this guy in his role of looking after the collective and also working across time, 
with that kind of divination, seeing the future, making things happen in space. So that's one story I want to tell you, so the food chain. I want to tell you another story, uh, which plugs into the legalization of, um, or at least the acceptance of ayahuasca in Brazil. There was a, uh, a journalist by the name of uh, Caetano Veloso, and he'd been given a job to go to the Amazon to go and look into this Santa Daime, and I believe we're talking about the 30s or 40s, or I might be wrong about that. A, basically, a Catholic bishop was grumbling about this nonsense going on in the jungle, and he went to go and investigate, and he interviewed Mestri, Mestri Reneo. And so he, when he arrived at Mestri's place, Mestri told him his name, told him he'd just been released from prison, as in told the journalist his name. And this is a famous trope from the indigenous world as well, when you rock up to the shaman, the shaman tells you who you are and you know, your journey there. Anyway, so Mestri tells him his name, tells him um, that he just got out of prison, uh, told him he had a scar in his leg, and uh, told him that he'd be back in Acre, back in that part of the world one day in the future. This guy, obviously surprised, said it was the most bizarre and incredible meeting he'd ever had. Uh, he was also a musician. The reason he'd be in prison is because this was in the middle of the Brazilian dictatorship. Um, no, so it must have been later. We're talking about later. Uh, no, forget that thing I just said about Brazilian dictatorship. I just got a bit lost there. Anyway, uh, Mestri gives him, well, spends three days drinking ayahuasca with him. We, we, he didn't say anything about what happened during those three days. But Mestri did give him a bottle of ayahuasca to take back up to Rio. And he did. He said, give this to your sensitive friends. And he gave some to Gilberto Gil. Are you familiar with Gilberto Gil? He's a, uh, Brazilian, he became the culture minister later. Played lots of Bob Marley songs. <laughs> Little dreadlocks. Um, anyway, this guy then did something I really recommend you don't do. He took a dose, he went to get a flight from Rio Airport to Sao Paulo, and when he arrived in Sao Paulo, there was some kind of a military, uh, um, the launch of a new military division or some, some kind of, it wasn't a dictatorship, so basically dictators marching around doing their thing. Uh, and that's when it kicked in, when he got to the airport. Um, and he describes how, um, how amazing it was to feel this love, uh, unconditional love, even from the oppressive army. And bear in mind, this was in the middle. You know, they were, they were going after artists, going after musicians. This guy was a musician. It's a very, very oppressive time in history. Um, many years later, uh, Gilberto Gil became the culture minister and was instrumental in uh, making ayahuasca cultural patrimony of Brazil, basically giving it protection from the law in Brazil. So again, we're seeing a really bizarre, and he tells this story, he told this story at, um, at a birthday, which, which again, rather bizarrely, Caetano, this journalist, was uh, his boss 40 years later, um, was uh, asked him if he'd ever been to Acre, and he told him the story. He said, well, that's interesting, because I've just got an invitation to Mestri's widow's anniversary. Should we go down and cover it? And he went down and covered it. Gilberto Gil was there and they were talking about the legalization of ayahuasca. So why is this interesting? Well here we've got Mestri and Eo doing the thing that shamans do, protecting the collective, responding to opportunities and threats through bizarre connections and weird magic, uh, working across space and time and redistributing resources. You know, here's a bottle of ayahuasca, which is here but it'd be doing a whole lot better if it was in, uh, if it was in Rio, you know. Today's threats. So what are we facing today? Um, I believe we live in a global village now, and I believe we're facing global threats. Um, with global problems, and we've got all these globalists running around wanting to do it for us as well. So well, we're facing threats which are quite different to what, they were, what, uh, what an indigenous tribe might be facing back in the day. Melting ice caps, changing weather systems, supply chain problems, climate refugees, 40 million North Africans, uh, facing famine, you know, uh, these, are big, these are big, big problems. Um, what can we do about these things? Well, as the climate changes and as farming, farming changes, I'm, I'm, I remember talking to a Zimbabwean farmer who was telling me how the crops that they're planting are now changed because, they're, uh, because the rainfall is changing, right? We're still going to be able to produce food, but we're going to have to be really, really clever about redistributing it if we're going to, uh, if we're going to stay alive, that's what I think. So the threats are massive. The solutions to those threats are 
same old solutions. Distributed network, uh, efficient resource distribution, responsive, responding to threats and opportunities, and working across space and time. How does an individual respond to collective threats? What do you, what can I do about melting ice caps? Right? Seems rather large, isn't it? Well, in the same way that um, we don't know how an individual amoeba works its way into that network and does incredible things by predicting the future, um, we have no idea what networked intelligence means, right? Um, so we don't know. But seems to me that our only hope at this point is to plug into a network and I want to say, uh, I don't want to say have faith because it's not about faith, it's about knowing. Knowing that a network is more intelligent than an individual and that across networks all kinds of really, really weird things happen if you open yourselves up to the magic. Um, since I've been working with RAIN, I've found outrageous connections happening all the time. Right? Um, often informed by my invisible friends. Could the networked intelligence of a distributed collective respond to challenges we fail to meet as individuals? So, I want to tell you about, about Rain, about um, my story. Um, yeah, my story as I left the Amazon, really. So, I'll get to this bus driver's question in a minute. So, I, I, I went to the Amazon. Uh, keen to understand more about Daimi, more about ayahuasca. Uh, I was writing um, a book at the time about magic, about medicine, about autonomy, about the history of medicine. It actually ended up being three books. This is one of them, this is another one. Second one's still in my head. Um, kind of partly on paper. Um, but anyway, so I went off to the jungle and there I was. Quite soon after I arrived, I got sick, I got um, bitten by a sand fly uh, and it opened up a, uh, a disease in my chest, like a, a parasite, flesh-eating parasite. I've talked at length about that and all the magic that surrounded it in other talks which you can check out. Uh, one of them is called Racism and Neocolonialism in the Academic Study of Ayahuasca. It's a good one because I'm looking at how uh, academics look at um, look at data from the jungle, from a cure, from a disease and a process, and how traditional people look at it, and how, um, how knowledge is, 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 how the discourse around knowledge happens. But anyway, that's a different talk. Um, so just, but just briefly, I had a, I got ill. Uh, I was ill for eight months. I lost a lot of weight. Um, I lost uh, an ex-wife. I lost, um, what else did I lose? Um, stuff I didn't need, really. Um, uh, I was, um, but, what, but like the people around me thought I should, or were very insistent I should take injections because it's a cousin of, um, it's kind of protozoal infection, it eats your flesh and then the second stage it can eat your nose and your cartilage of your throat and all that kind of stuff. I'd gone there because I wanted to learn about ayahuasca, I wanted to learn about daimi and I was interested in the history and philosophy of medicine which is my academic background. So, and also I'd made a very specific intention when I went out there, learn about Daimi, and this was my perfect opportunity. So I decided to, to go with it really, to see, see if I could cure this with Daimi and to see what happened if I did. And it was amazing. People all thought I was crazy around me because the kind of pharmaceutical medicine had, has advanced quite far into the jungle at this point. Um, but, <coughs> so I had, um, I spent some time, yeah, eight months ill, about five months drinking every day uh, during that first thing in the morning. And I learned a whole load of stuff. One of the things I learned was uh, appreciation for the curative powers of the forest. Because I, I was treating this disease with barks of a mango tree and barks of a cajuera tree and barks of a uh, mulatera tree. Um, all kinds of diets, all kinds of prayers, all kinds of austerities, meeting 400-year-old slaves incorporated into the bodies of mediums to do uh, rituals over my illness and stuff like that. So um, I got better towards the end of it. A woman who was nursing me back to health, uh, well, we ended up having a whole bunch of children. Um, the first two uh, twins, they were born with birthmarks in the same place that I had my scar. 
Uh, it's a crazy story. It's a really, really magical story. You must check out my other talk. But we're not going to talk about that now. Um, so um, I came out of the jungle, uh, went to Minas Gerais, which is the middle of the, the middle of Brazil. So after living in the, in the Amazon for a year, I went to go and live there. By this point, my girlfriend uh, was pregnant. I went to introduce myself to her parents and her brothers. Um, brothers took me swimming in a, in a, a stream and it was very beautiful, and um, dragonflies and fish everywhere nibbling. I don't think I'd ever seen a belly so white as mine. Um, the fish uh, and the people. Um, anyway, uh, we came, um, so uh, some years later, I went back to Brazil to show off the children uh, to the same place, and that stream I was telling you about had dried up, and uh, it was five years later, and uh, my, um, yeah, it was, a real, it was a real shock to see. I, I'd never seen such a thing. I was genuinely shocked. And all the, re, all the rivers in that region are drying up. There's a wave of desertification, which is going, rolling over Brazil. There's one river actually left. It's called the uh, River Arasuai, and it's dropping. You can see the water level drop every year. Uh, this is terrifying, uh, what's going on in Brazil. The whole hydrology of the entire country is a mess. Um, it affects the monsoons and the rains in Africa, this kind of thing. So our global weather systems are breaking down. What can I do about that as an individual? Well, uh, a bus driver. The first thing I did actually was um, basically organized a bus trip to uh, an agroforestry center for some farmers that, uh, that lived in, in the area because agroforestry is a, a way of planting trees and crops together. Uh, the farming, the kind of farming that they have, let's say, inherited from, uh, from our culture is um, slash and burn monoculture, and it's terrible for the environment there. Um, so anyway, uh, I wanted to introduce actually my in-laws um, to agroforestry and organized a busload of farmers to go to the center. The bus driver was also the mayor of a town called Cachoeira. Cachoeira means waterfall. That is the waterfall. It also means rapids. So that used to be rapids. Uh, it's not, it's dried up now. Uh, it dried up in the 1920s. So the town, as I said, the town is named after the waterfall, but the waterfall isn't there anymore. Um, this bus driver asked me if we could help sponsor a sapling nursery at the school. Um, and we said, yes, what should we do? Um, so we started uh, um, reforesting springs around, around the area. So those are, that's Cachoeira, that town there. Um, you, there's, uh, that's San Sebastián de Boa Vista. Each one of these towns has a whole bunch of springs around it, and most of the springs are dried up, silted up, and dying, or dead. Uh, so that's where we started. First activity we did was sponsor this guy to uh, basically regenerate that spring and to start planting trees around there. Once you plant trees in, um, in a spring, it uh, basically when it rains it holds the water longer and then it returns the water to the river longer. So as you can probably guess I'm into networks and the original network of the land is the, is the water systems, right? So that's, that's where we decided to start working with the underground water and the overground water systems and the hydro hydrological systems. Um, so from there we went and started sponsoring schools nurseries to, uh, as in sapling nurseries, so we're working with kids to make saplings that can then go to be planted out in these various places. Um, so just noticing how we're working here and how that follows the mycorrhizal root network and the network thinking, right? We're responding to needs. We don't have a plan for the particular people who we're working with. So this is a very much a, let's say, a decolonial uh, uh, cooperative way of working with people in, in Brazil, in these frontline communities facing climate change and facing all these threats. Yeah, wor working with what they need, uh, not particularly because, I mean, because that's, that's how you do it, as in it doesn't work. We've had a long time of NGOs trying to impose something and it hasn't been working. Um, so we fundraised, oops, uh, we respond to their needs, we fundraised across their network, across our network, and were redistributing nutrients to scarcity. So basically sending money over to Brazil. Uh, but we also needed media to come back so we could work through our network. So there's a kind of exchange there which we had to set up. Um, 
Next page. Uh, how does this, how does, the, how does that kind of network thinking work in the way that I manage or we manage my NGO? There's three ways that you can set up a system. Uh, centralized, decentralized, and distributed. When you try and set up a decentralized network, this tends to happen, it's called clumping. Right? This is what goes wrong in human networks. Uh, this means basically, because I'm quite good at networking, if I meet someone and bring them into the network, they tend to talk to me. And that means I have one more thing to do to try and do that. So the business of management is very much trying to make connections outside of me or outside of these various centers to stop this matter of clumping. And that's, again, following how the mycorrhizal root network works. Um, we're working with schools twinning. So this is an example of how that avoiding clumping happens. So we have this is a school in the indigenous world, the Tenena Indigenous Nation. Uh, so we're working with them producing uh, so they're producing media, uh, we've got some lesson plans around food, we've got 36 lesson plans, and we've twinned them with a school in the UK. So we've got kids in the UK taking photos of their dinner, uh, talking about food miles, talking to their grandparents about uh, how this stuff's produced, and then the kids uh, send videos to each other, make their own connections together, and they could take that relationship wherever they like. Those schools can bring in businesses to support each other, right? So we're really trying to push away uh, we were trying to be the network where things happen rather than the instigators of things happening, if that makes sense. So that's going rather, rather beautifully, that one. Um, it requires the uh, free movement of information. So as the network, we spend most of our time trying to iron out problems in communication because there are many, many problems in communication beyond just linguistic. Working with indigenous groups, for example, often they don't read Portuguese. Often, that on top of the fact that they've, we've got hundreds of years of abuse, people who look like me have abused horribly people who look like that, and they're just, you know, when they meet a gringo, it's like, what do you want now, you know? Uh, so for us to overcome those uh, historical scars, it's quite a lot of work, and we're doing it in various different ways. I'll show you, um, uh, part of it's trust, but also new protocols for communication, which is what mycorrhizal root networks do. They're really good at communicating. Information exchange. This is a project in the favela of Hesifi. This is a black women's group who worked with this woman here. She's called Mariana from um, Pernambuco University. She did a project working with the favela, these women of the favela, uh, asking them what they wanted in terms of agroecology in their city, setting up demonstration centers to show people how to collect water off their roof or how to grow food in their, in their gardens. Um, how to make compost, all these kind of things. And these got put into a booklet, a beautiful booklet, which uh, um, does all this kind of stuff and plenty more. Um, we then help them fundraise across our network to expand that from one favela into nine favelas. Uh, and then we translated it into English, so that's the nine favelas in Hesifi. Then we translated it into English for a Kenyan refugee camp because we got contacted by this guy. So this Educational materials from the favela are now being used in, a, in, in his refugee camps, like 250,000 people in Kenya. Five different, um, what is it? I think it's like five languages. So currently it's being translated, it's already been translated into French, being translated into Kiswahili as well, and Arabic, right? The Arabic version is also going to go to the occupied territories as well. So again, what we, what we do is stretching out this network, moving information and resources around to see where they're useful. And you see kind of similarities in the experiences because, for example, in the indigenous world, they're facing land grabs, right? Why, why are we involving ourselves with indigenous worlds? Why are we planting trees in indigenous uh, reserves when they're much more likely to be chopped down by aggressive agribusiness doing land grabs? Well, we want to globalize that problem, right? If it... If you hear about a land grab, you hear about some Guarani guy getting shot somewhere or other, whose name you can't pronounce, and you don't know where he is, you think, oh, that's a terrible shame, isn't it? If these are connected directly to a school in Oxford or a business in London, you know, that becomes business interest problem. That becomes the problem of people in the UK. So there's a very much a political edge to what we're doing here. Um, and the same, in, obviously, in the occupied territories. There's people facing land grabs facing quite a similar situation, although it's a very long way away. <clears throat> infochemical. So an infochemical um, is, the way that, is the way that trees communicate across the mycorrhizal root network. So I mentioned, I mentioned it before when, you, when we were talking about a threat. 
How does an infochemical, what does it need to do? First thing it needs to do is it needs to spread. Yeah, if it doesn't spread, it's not a good infochemical. Second thing it needs to do is it needs to, to trigger an appropriate response in the, uh, in the members of the community which it encounters, right? I have seen, I don't know how many thousands of pictures of the Amazon burning. Uh, we've been seeing that for donkey's years. I've seen so many graphs of how many hectares are destroyed every second. Uh, that doesn't seem to be making a difference. So clearly the communication system isn't working. Well, something's going wrong, isn't it? Like, who wants to share images? I don't want to share images of the Amazon burning with my mum, you know? Uh, so we design our media in line with how infochemicals are designed. So what do you do? We work with art, for example. We work with music, uh, videos. I'm going to give you an example of one of those. Uh, but first, I'm just going to show you um, another way we're working with art is so this was a storyboard that we got made by a Marvel storyboarder in order to describe to our indigenous partners what the process of, of a partnership will look like. Because the, A, they can't read very well in this particular group. B, they don't think that gringos can be trusted unless they've signed something. And C, if you don't lay out the process really well and something goes wrong, it's very easy for all that trauma to come and fill the gap. You know, oh, we've been screwed by gringos again. Right, so um, this is one of the ways we use art. I'm going to show you another one. Um, so this is two projects. Actually, maybe I'll just jump here first. Um, yeah, so one of the, we're doing one project with the Nokikoi Indigenous Nation, uh, and we're doing one project with um, a particular tree called the Pernambuco tree. The Pernambuco tree is used to make violin bows. It's been used since the 1740s. Uh, it's a, it's it's particularly resonant, it's particularly strong, and it holds a fixed curve. So the sound of the violin that you know is because of one tree, and no other tree can make that sound. And there's only probably about 2,000 of them still left standing in the world. They're massively endangered, right? So we're working uh, on a project to plant 50,000 of these trees, some of them with agroforestry systems. But that opens up a really interesting collaboration with the classical music world. Um, so I'm just going to play you a little bit of this one, uh, which is the first collaboration we did. Um, we're playing a Chiquinho Gonzaga tune. Chiquinho Gonzaga was a Brazilian um, mixed race woman, the first female composer in Brazil, the mother of Sorinho. And this is Victoria Malova, who's one of the top violinists in the world. So we managed to get um, all these classical music together uh, to because this is a really good way of doing infochemicals. Much better than, oh my god, the Amazon's burning. Uh, Classic FM shared this one, for example. I'm just going to play a little bit more of that and I'm going to show you another one. Enough of that. So that's um, a kind of simple uh, introduction to, what do you call it, to the Treaty Music one. But I want to just talk, the far last thing I'm going to say actually is about um, cross-fertilising. How, what happens when you get out of the way and allow these, um, allow these um, connections to be made, allow these fruiting bodies to emerge from those connections. So as I mentioned, we have a project with the Noki Koi and uh, it's an Amazonian group, they're also called the Katakina. Um, it's an agroforestry project, but also a cultural uh, conservation project. So this is a particular group which they still have their language, but the old people uh, who are the guardians of certain you know, ceramics traditions and musical traditions and farming traditions are dying off and they haven't really passed on their knowledge. So our project, which we're raising money for, is to sponsor these guys to do workshops for the younger generation. Uh, partly because it's one of the few, in fact it's the only thing which has managed to keep, to keep the young people in this particular community out of the drug trade because it's on the, it's on the border of Bolivia and Peru and that's where all the cocaine comes through. And these people who've already been dispersed, already lost a lot of their culture, are quite often getting drawn into the drug trade uh, there. But investing in their culture has proved to be a way of uh, keeping them out of that, really. Um, so this is a song by the, sung and played by the leader of the Nokikoi Indigenous Nation, backed up by two London orchestras. So this is the fruiting of two of our projects coming together. 
And we'll just watch this for a moment. Oops. This song is about the rubber boom in the Western Amazon, right? So fires arriving is when uh, people, basically people, people were brought in as rubber tappers and there was an ethnic cleansing operation pushing these people out of, pushing the Nokikoi out of their land. So by reviving this song, it's a hundred year old song, reproducing this song and getting it backed up by two London orchestras in a London church, finding a way of bringing this story back into our networks, generating support in our networks, and let me say, by, by showcasing the beauty of these cultures and the richness of their cultures of resistance, rather than showing you images of the Amazon burning, the idea is to, to provoke an appropriate response in the people who have the power to respond, because it's us who's buying the meat which is raised on soy farms that have, were, were that were that were um, that were sowed in, in 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 the Amazon. It's us that's buying the petrol. It's us that's enabling the governments and the financial institutions, which are still destroying these people's land. Another little bizarre connection is I got connected by do you know who Miriam Margulies is. Miriam Margulies is, uh, she's in Harry Potter. She's the witch in Harry Potter. She's, uh, do you recognize this voice? Too young, maybe. So, um, this is what happens when you, when you make connections and uh, beauty can arise out of the, out of the space. I'm nearly finished now, I'm just going to, I think I've just got one more slide. Back to the original question, uh, why get high, what's the point, what can we bring back to the world, what am I supposed to do? Uh, and here's a quiz question, could the network's intelligence of a distributed collective respond to the challenges we fail to meet as individuals? Networked intelligence is about connecting, communicating, collaborating. Communication creates community. Communities share burdens and abundance. And the other thing about a network is it's magic. So I'd like to invite anybody to plug into our network, to the RAIN network. If you've got anything, if you've got any ideas to bring, if you've got any contacts, if you've got any money, uh, if you've got any, if you've got any uh, resources, then we're definitely we're looking for collaboration and looking to do some really good stuff through networked intelligence. And these are my books. That one's called Neuroapocalypse. That one's called Science Revealed. I'm not going to tell you about them. Thank you very much.